Hey everyone, this is Jens Anfer in my shop here in Denmark. So in this episode, I actually wanted to show you what the shop also looks like every now and again. I am somewhat of a control freak. I always like things neat and organized, but deadlines, ugh. I'm not a fan of deadlines. I do get a lot of stuff done when I have deadlines, but have a look at this mess and it's it's not good. I just got back the day before yesterday from uh, 10 days in the US and I was working almost right up until I got on a plane. So I basically left my shop in this condition, which is a little hard for me to do, but you have to do what you got to do. So today I'll actually be a little more honest about the condition of things than what you usually see on social media where everything is neatly organized and all that. But this is also a very true picture of how my daily life is in the shop. You can't work in a conditions like this, but I often end up doing it anyway. So for these uh, first couple of minutes or half hour, couple of hours of worth of shooting, <laughs> I will tidy up here and then um, we have some new deadlines coming. I have my launch 15 coming up and my first international knife show or at least American knife show after COVID which I'm super excited. I'm going to the NYCKS New York Custom Knife Show in by end of February. So uh, today I'll also line up some of the stuff that I, I need to work on. But um, have a look and, uh, and you'll see me doing some tidying up. For me, it's... it's it's a very zen-like thing to tidy up my shop. I'm tidying up the shop, but I'm also tidying up my thoughts. And even though I hate when my shop is in this state, it actually makes sense for me to let it slide every now and again, because it will create a moment for me to actually get my thoughts tidied up as well. This is also when I start putting thoughts together about okay, which knives do I need to bring to the next show? Hmm, should I try some new techniques? Should I come up with a new product for next quarter? Stuff like that. In the process of tidying up, it's a non-thought process, just putting things where they belong. So this allows my brain to just wonder. And it's super, super good process to just be aware of, of what's going on in this point. <laughs> So this whole tidying up has me thinking every single time that I do this that oh, I really need to have a deep dive into organizing the shop. Because even though it's starting to look a little better, shelves like this, hmm, maybe there's stuff in here that I don't need anymore. I had these thoughts for a while. 2023 will be the year where I do a deep dive organizing in basically the whole shop, the whole house. And uh, one of the projects that I want to do is redo this whole setup here, both for better organizing, but also making it a little more nice. It's cool, don't get me wrong, I like it, I love it. I love being in the shop. Uh, it's just not, it's not quite there. So I started analyzing a little bit. I think every four or five years or so, I get this need to change things up. I will change position of furniture. In this case, I will start thinking about my processes. Is this 100% working to my liking? No, it's not. Well, then it's, it's time to reorganize. Here's one of the things where things get a little sketchy. This is one of the things I'm not super proud about. So this is a box of stuff and it's, it's not just crap, it's actually tools and stuff. But every now and again, I will do a quick cleanup. Let's put everything in a box and I'll see to that later. At some point, I will take these boxes and just move into storage. And I have a lot of boxes in storage with stuff that I don't even 
recall owning. So that's another thing for 23 is to go through all my boxes of crap. I do this all the time. I have corners that just pack up with stuff that I don't particularly know where to put. And it just ugh, bugs me. Some people would say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have this mess in the corners to keep you inspired and stuff. And if you look over there, oh, that's a cool idea. No, this, these corners is where all the potential energy is just being sucked into. And it's not even bad right now. It's been worse, but it's starting to really bug me. Obviously, most of my tools have a fixed position. And then I'm missing one pair of clippers here. And I'm just like, come on, somebody borrowed it. I don't like when tools migrate. So at least in my mind, I'm very focused on every tool in each place. And if you need a set of pliers here, and but if you need it in the next room, you have another one there. I don't want to go look for stuff. And I'm not all the way there yet. And it's a constant process to keep rethinking how the different processes in the shop works. And I'm in constant involvement of changing my techniques and stuff like that. So it's something that will change a lot over the course of just a year. I like to keep my shop very dedicated for the specific kind of jobs that I, I do here and keep all the rest of the tools. And trust me, I have tons of tools that are not in the shop, but in the, the rough shop. So about reaching the point where I'm comfortable about working in the shop again, but then what's this? This is just, well, this one goes on the, one of the grinders, it's just mess that doesn't have any fixed position in the shop. And this is just another reminder for me, oh, I really, really need to reorganize the entire shop. Oh yeah, and maybe I should figure out a system for all my belts. Come on, look at this. What is all this? So many belts, it's also here? Yeah. They're everywhere. So I follow this principle that I was taught by one of the old timers back in the day who told me to consider belts as free. Belts are freaking expensive when you start using them in the amounts that I do. But use a, a worn belt for something where you, ha you should have used a, a fresh belt will ruin so much work and set you back. So I actually consider my belts to be free. That said, I still use belts for different operations where they don't need to be brand new. Actually, in some operations, it's better that they're a little worn down or just it took the edge off. I probably have 600, 700 belts here and half of them are definitely ready to get thrown out. Sometimes I like to tear things down to build them up again, just because it forces me to think critical about each operation that I do. So even though it, it, it sounds counterproductive to tear your shop down, only to just rebuild it almost exactly like it was before, but the almost factor in there might save you a little time every day, just make it work just a little bit better. It's, it's well worth it. So last thing is to vacuum the whole shop and we are ready to look at some knives. We established the shop somewhat. Now I'm able to breathe and work again in here. Every now and again I catch myself in just letting the shop slide while I'm working and then I have to stop everything get it back into order and then then I can work again this was definitely one of those times now we can actually start looking at some knives I am a strong believer in having means to organize if if you don't have systems it's impossible to organize so I juggle around with a lot of knife parts so we created these these trays that allows me to drag knife parts 
in between uh, shop spaces. They stack nicely because of these notches and it just keeps everything nice and balanced. Getting organized is super important and having means to do that is super important. We will work on some Monte Carlos. These will be for the next launch, launch 15. These are just a bunch of handles, partially done. And I know that I want to make eight of these, so I'm just gonna pick out some handles and then uh, discuss some of the process with you guys. One of my plans with these Monte Carlos and probably a couple of casinos as well is to do my, right now I even forget what, it, what I, used to call it, but I put my crown A on the side in sterling silver. So I figured that would be a, that could be an interesting thing to show you guys. I'm not the very best at soldering, but um, that's, what we, that's what we're gonna see now, at least. Maybe just a little prep work on the grinders first, and then we'll do some soldering. So I pick out a couple of handles in brass and bronze, and that's what we are going to work on. So for this specific Launch 15, I wanted to uh, work with uh, patinas and uh, surface treatments, textures and such. I will make six to eight casinos. So I will pick out a bunch of handles that I know will give me the canvas to do some experiments on texturing and stuff like that. So I, I don't really pick out anything specific, but I think about the number of knives that I want completed. And then I pick six sets of handles and then start just thinking about the, the end product. What do I want for the end product? So let's pick a tray here, get rid of these, so we have an empty tray here. Yes, what are you doing? <laughs> I just, I usually stamp my handles and I have this one that feels a little heavier than titanium. Zirconium is a little heavier and I'm just thinking is this titanium or is it zirconium? In the raw state you can't tell the difference between titanium and, uh, and zirconium except for weight. They look identical when they're, when it's just raw metal. So, but the weight is different. That's how I can tell the difference. So I'm gonna run and get the scales. So this was Cirque, there's a difference of five grams from titanium to Cirque, which is kind of insignificant. Five grams, what's that? Nothing, but you can actually feel the difference. So I'm just gonna grab a Sharpie and just put a C here. I just talked with Anas about, Anas is the camera guy. Uh, I was just talking about the light in the shop and it's something I've always been particular about. And I think since I was a kid sitting in my room drawing and stuff like that, I had lamps everywhere. Everywhere I would sit and work with something, I had like an elbow lamp. These are called architect's lamps in Denmark. I have these everywhere. In this next Preparation phase of um, the handles for the casinos and Monte Carlos for my launch 15 is adding a densifying stamp to each part here. And with the casinos and Monte Carlos specifically, I will give them a stamp with the material of the handle because on these, the liners, clips and spacer are not individually fitted. But when doing the patina work on the brass, copper and bronze, it gets difficult to tell them apart. So, so just for ease of mind, I give each handle a stamp. So for this particular part in the process of preparing these handles, I'm using this beautiful Japanese hammer that I imported specifically for this task and this task alone. I similarly love this part of, of the process where I'm stamping my knife parts. So on most all my, my folders, I will stamp each part with a number and especially for orders. So I can 
say, okay, part number three is for this specific order, okay, then the spacer needs to be that color. In this case, I'm dealing with four, five different materials, and I will stamp each part with a letter rather than a number specifying which material it is. In this case, I'm stamping bronze, brass, copper, zirconium, titanium. Uh, I don't stamp the, stamp the titanium, which means that if it's not stamped, it's supposed to be titanium and, and not zirconium. For instance, you can't tell the difference. Anyways, it's not like I need any more hammers, but I was using this hammer for the process for a number of years. Maybe I'm starting to see a pattern here, but this is not a cool hammer. It's not nice. It doesn't give me joy using. So I guess I, I did a little Mary Kondo on this one and said, does this give me any pleasure? Does it make me happy? No, nope. I'm keeping it for pounding on other stuff, but I wanted something that actually emphasized this process alone and how much I actually enjoy stamping my parts. So I imported this beautiful hammer, modified the handle just a little bit. It was like this long. So now it's mine. I modified it, makes it mine. And um, let's stamp some stuff, but let's get rid of this one. So incidentally, I'm stamping bronze now and they get a B. Later on, I will stamp brass and what letter should that have? Well, since it can't also be B, I decided to mark those with M for missing, which is brass in Danish. So if you get a knife from me that has the letter M on it, it's brass. Just clarifying a little. It's one of those things I can't really explain why this gives me so much joy standing part. Maybe actually Come to think of it, I have this friend in the, in the Danish knife community that I've known for 35 years, oh my god, close to 35 years at least, 33 years. He was one of the first knife makers that I met ever. I was probably 17, 18, and I saw that there was a local hunting fair, and at that fair you had some Danish knife maker set up. And at that point I've made knives for a few years, but I've never met another knife maker. So I went to this hunting fair and made friends with two or three knife makers there. And I've known them since. But this one guy, Jesper, he said that while stamping your work is strictly for the craftsman, nobody else is allowed to stamp, put a stamp into your work. You can have other artists do work on your knives, but stamping is solely for the craftsman. And I, I guess that kind of resonated with me and stayed with me since. So stamping is it's just one of those little things that I enjoy and comes to think of it. Actually shooting these YouTube videos makes me think a lot about my uh, my process trying to put words on something that i've been doing for all my adult life really hundreds of years yes i'm old i've made knives since 1989. what was your birthday Arnus? the 5th of november 1989. <laughs> yeah that's what i'm dealing with kids when i was in college i started thinking quite hard about the profession as a knife maker. At that point, I didn't really have any intentions of being a full-time knife maker, but it was, a, it was a thought process that was starting to, to form. And back then, one of the icons in my world, whom I've later be befriended, is Bob Tassola. He is the godfather of the modern folding knife, for sure. And I recall when I was in college, he turned 50. And I thought, oh, it's a lot of years. And this year I'm turning 50. Oh. So I guess that makes me the OG now. When I was starting this game, you could do, I would fall down from a roof and just get up, keep on working. 
if I sleep with the wrong pillow. <laughs> My neck will hurt for three days. So yeah, getting old sucks, but it's better than the alternative. That's it. I got everything stamped. Let's continue with uh, the next exciting thing, which is getting my Crown A logo on the side of some of these. So this is a thin sheet of sterling silver that I milled my logo into with uh, one of my CNC's. So I'm just gonna grind the back side a little bit, and then I can pop the logos out and prepare them for soldering on to the, um, to the handles here. So this is the front of my crowned A logo, and I milled them, if you can see it in the light. It's milled basically through. You can see the profile on the back, but I can't pop them out just yet, so I'm just gonna grind the back side here just a little bit. So I'm uh, just preparing to do some uh, final grinding on these uh, Monte Carlo blades, some finish grinding. So I'm just looking at these. These are damascus steel blades for the Monte Carlos that we just prepared the handles for. So that means up devices on because I can't see pretty much anything without them. Comes with the old age, you know. Here's one of the things where belts are free. But I don't start out with a fresh belt because the process that I'm about to start doing will just knock all the teeth out of the a fresh belt. So I'll start it out with a semi-fresh belt and then move on to a fresh belt. So here's one of the very good examples of treating your belts like they're free. When you buy belts and it's five, 10, $15 per belt, they don't seem free. It's not a lot of money, but when you buy 500 belts at a time, it adds up. What's the cost of a blade in damascus steel? I don't even know. It's not cheap, that's for sure. If you treat your belts like they're free, you don't ruin a perfectly good blade because of that. And that is a lesson that you you have to come up with by yourself. You actually have to ruin a few blades to see the benefit of treating belts like they're free. Just because ruining a perfectly good blade because you got cheap and wanted to get just a little more life out of a belt, it's not worth it. So we're moving on to the Hardcore Maximizer. It's the state-of-the-art horizontal grinder that just works so well for doing finish grind on the edges of a blade and doing some chamfers and stuff like that. So now I'm gonna grind the profile on the blade and uh, chamfer all the edges. And for that, we need a fresh belt. So now we just saw some of the process behind my Monte Carlo folder. Hope you enjoyed this episode and please subscribe, hit like, write a comment. If you liked what you saw, if you hated what you saw, write a comment. I'd like to see it all. And um, until next time, I will see you later. Jens out.